day, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Maggie Kulik. I'm the founder and CEO of Chicory Wealth. And um, this is our uh, first webinar of what I think is officially fall or soon to be officially fall 2022. So um, glad to be here. I'm joined today with our um, investment manager, Daniel McNabb. He's on with me. And um, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to start by just uh, talking a little bit about where we're at from a markets perspective, macro perspective. It's hard. If you are, um, if you have a pulse, you probably know a lot about <laughs> our economic situation right now because it's all over the news, inflation, et cetera. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to... Um, move on to things that I like to think of that we can control on like markets, which will be um, Daniel telling us a little bit about proxy voting, what it is, why it matters to us and some of um, what we've engaged in and some shareholder activism issues we've engaged in and maybe engaging in more in the future. And then we'll finish off with a kind of high level view of some recent um, additions to our model portfolio. Um, and the why of that. So because we are recording today, if you've just joined, please do put yourself on mute um, and go ahead and, and stay off camera if you don't mind. But if you do have a comment or question, please feel free to put it in the chat feature and we will try and um, uh, catch those either along the way or at the end, um, depending on uh, question. So uh, I'll start just, um, there've been, um, several things we've been watching all year, really probably for the last two years, it seems like. So for those of you who have joined on a regular basis, you know there's certain um, key things um, I keep an eye on, most market participants keep an eye on. Um, but just to sort of locate us, for those of you who aren't aware, um, and I'm going to use the S&P 500 as a proxy when I talk about the market. Right now, um, year to date, the S&P is down about 18, a little over 18%. Um, that puts us uh, still about, if my math is right, about six-ish percent above the um, deepest decline we experienced year to date in the S&P, uh, but also um, well below the high uh, that was achieved over the last year. Um, so the market, you know, uh, kind of rallied back somewhat after those June lows. And um, not unlike a lot of bear market rallies petered out uh, <laughs> recently. Um, and then a few days ago, I can't remember now exactly when, we had quite a significant sell-off um, post-inflation reading. Uh, and uh, it is true that the rate of change of inflation is slowing down but the inflation numbers were still extremely high and they were higher, I think, than most traders anticipated them to be. And that translates into the Fed uh, likely being, um, continuing to have to be very, very aggressive. The Fed has said that they're going to uh, be sensitive to macroeconomic uh, information, meaning in, in Fed speak, that means you know be, be sensitive to a real slowdown um, that might head uh, the economy into a recession. But they have said several times that their target is to get inflation back to 2%. And inflation is running, you know, eight, eight and a half. Um, that's a big gap. And that, uh, and the market is finally believing that the Fed is going to continue to raise rates, even if, um, I think the market believes, even if the Fed sends us into a, a more than shallow, we don't know how serious, but more than shallow recession. So that certainly is part of what we're seeing in the sell-off. Although again, that we sort of took a breather yesterday, the market was up a little bit. On a year-over-year -year basis, S&P is down 10.68%. The NASDAQ year-to-date is down 25%. That is a lot of growth-oriented stocks. Um, so, uh, it's not really a lot of fun out there right now. And um, the other thing that's that's interesting, interesting maybe isn't the right word. Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it alarming. I would call it sort of, I guess, what you would expect is just looking at where yields are on, on treasuries. 
Um, the two-year treasury now is above 4%, um, but we do have an invert, what they call an inverted yield curve, which means longer-term rates are lower than these shorter term rates. So the yield curve, like basically the curve is going like this. I could show you, but I'm not gonna go off camera to show you a, uh, a picture of it. Um, but clearly, um, you know, when you have, um, when you can buy a two year treasury and get 4%, um, it starts to uh, make market participants wonder why they shouldn't, um, especially with a market, uh, with the stock market as volatile as it is. So bonds are finally, you know, for 15 years, there's almost been no there there in yields and in the bond market. And now suddenly there is how long that lasts is anybody's guess, but it could be quite a long time. Um, so that certainly is having an impact on um, how the market understands uh, what the price of a growth stock should be, or even what the price of a dividend stock should be in a way that we haven't seen in quite a while. Um, and uh, the you know, the, the debate, of course, is how strong is the economy overall, how, how strong is uh, employment, and even if the Fed continues to raise rates, and they're likely this week to go at least 75 basis points, maybe they'll go 1%, we don't really know yet. Um, you know, will we, will the economy be strong enough to not fall into a pretty significant recession? We're clearly seeing a slowdown in housing, unsurprisingly. I think I heard yesterday that the average 30-year mortgage rate is now at 6.3%. For those of us of a certain age who bought, <laughs> who bought our first house when it was 8 or 9%, 6.3 doesn't see, I mean, it's, it's still, though, extremely high relative to where we were. And it's not just the fact that it's gotten there, it's how fast it's gotten there. A year ago, uh, last month, I closed on a house in Atlanta, some of you know, and, and my mortgage, my 30-year mortgage rate was about 2.25, I think, 2.25%. So now here we are about a year later at six and a half. That's a big move. It's definitely slowing housing down. Uh, there's housing, uh, it's definitely softening the housing market, even as rents continue to go up. So it's a, um, it's confusing seas out there. And uh, I don't th think it's going to not be confusing uh, for a while. Um, I was, this is anecdotal. I'll go briefly on this. I was having a conversation with my, uh, I have a very beloved cousin, my age, an attorney, very sharp cookie. We were talking on Saturday night uh, and asking ourselves, where, where have all the folks who used to work gone? Why, why are we, why, maybe Daniel, maybe you have some ideas about this. I have, I have yet to read a compelling uh, argument as to where everybody has gone. Like, has everybody retired? Is it about immigration? Is it just a combination of things? Is it, but it does seem like employment is so tight. It is so hard to find workers, certainly in industries that had notoriously paid, you know, less than minimum wage, obviously. Um, but even in other areas. So it's a really, we're in a, just a very interesting sea change, um, mm -hmm. all of which has happened very quickly. And the market is still trying to adjust to that. But um, as we say, uh, practically every time we do these kinds of webinars, um, uh, Chicory Wealth and other firms like ours that are in the business of helping people long-term um, manage their wealth for the rest of their lives are not traders. And so our time horizons are not um, six months or a year or two years, they're five years and 10 years and 15 and 20 and 30 years. So um, I know many of you and many of the folks we work with do take the long view. Um, it can be very painful at times um, to watch your portfolio go down, uh, but it is the nature of the beast and um, we'll get through it. Uh, and there are some things that could turn the tides very quickly uh, and create some optimism, even the most recent victories in uh, Ukraine um, relative to that conflict, that war really um, has, I think, in, in injected some optimism. And certainly some things could happen there that might improve our situation very significantly. So with that, 
I'm going to stop there. And as I said, we're going to turn today to things we can control. <laughs> I like the market. We're going to talk a little bit about um, proxy voting, what it is, how we do it, um, uh, et cetera. So Daniel, why don't you take it away, please? Sure. Uh, so I'll start just with uh, a description of what proxy voting is. Um, so proxy voting is the uh, the process by which owners of a company uh, vote at the annual meeting um, on issues that uh, affect the company's management. So um, when I talk about owners of a, of a company, in this context, it means shareholders. Um, so every year, a corporate, uh, publicly traded corporation has an, an annual meeting where they vote on uh, the board of directors who are the uh, representatives of the owners at the company, um, executive compensation, so how much the CEO, the CFO are paid at the company, um, and certain other issues that we'll touch on in a moment. Um, but uh, so proxy voting, every shareholder uh, who owns a share, a voting share uh, of a corporation can place a vote uh, for the board of directors for the compensation or against those, those items. Um, so um, what's important to know about uh, this process is that the votes are often non-binding, uh, meaning that uh, the uh, uh, owners, the uh, board of directors, and the uh, executive management of the company are not obligated to change a behavior based off of the, the vote. Um, for example, when it comes to uh, executive compensation, um, if a compensation vote fails, where enough shareholders say, okay, you're paying the CEO too much, or, um, you know, not linking their pay to long-term performance, we're going to vote against this and say 60% of owners vote against that, uh, that pay package, um, it, the, the, the company can still pay the CEO that, that amount. So it's not a binding resolution in most cases. However, these votes do apply very public pressure to the company um, and often result in changes. Um, I believe in, there was a study in 2018 where the study looked at companies that had failed their compensation votes and found that over half of them changed their compensation policies in some way. Um, so it, it does have an impact. Um, and, and so when, when we look at proxy voting, uh, it's something that a lot of people don't take advantage of. If they hold individual stocks, they might not know about proxy voting. Um, it's tedious, uh, especially if you own a lot of individual stocks. Um, you know, you never you have to know when the meetings are. You have to uh, go online and vote. They used to send out a kind of a, a, ma a mailer where you kind of fill in the little bubbles and mail it out um, to to the company. But it can be you know kind of overwhelming, and it's not even an option if you own like an ETF. So if you own like the S&P 500 ETF and you're an individual, currently you don't really have a say on any of those 500 companies that are held in that ETF. You, you don't get to vote their proxies. Uh, the company that runs that ETF, you know, BlackRock or Vanguard, they would vote the proxy at that, at that meeting. Um, and so holding individual stocks allows you to cast a vote, have a say about uh, how the company is run. Um, and at Chicory, we do vote the proxies for our clients. Um, and the kind of things that we look at when we vote these proxies are um, issues that, that we think um, make the company more accountable to its shareholders. So that would be things like looking at the board of directors and seeing how many of those members are independent of the, the company management. Often in the US and uh, in other countries, Japan is notorious for this. 
the board of directors will include the CEO, um, sometimes other executives from the company. And if if this this body is supposed to be supposed to be accountable to the shareholders, it's it's supposed to be their representation. It's best practice that that board be majority, at least majority independent, um, and um, ideally have an independent uh, manager. Uh, so there's usually a, a lead on that board of directors. And so we like to see an independent lead. Um, and so uh, we, we factor those, those, uh, those things in when we vote for the, the board of directors. For executive compensation, we look at uh, if that compensation is tied to long-term performance for the company. Um, we look at you know, if, if the CEO is paid over 100 times more than the median salary of the employees at the company, that's a red flag. Um, and we, we, have, we have kind of a whole host of these guidelines um, that were put together by a company called As You Sew, uh, very comprehensive uh, collection of guidelines. And, um, and that kind of- gender, I might add, right? I want to insert, gender, we yes, care if, very much about diversity of the board. Diversity of the from board. From a gender perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that it's a, you know, a very comprehensive process there. Um, and we also, you know, so we, we, we vote these for all of the, the stocks that our clients hold, including stocks that are legacy positions, say a client has, uh, Exxon Mobil that they can't sell because of tax implications. We can vote the proxy on that as well, which, um, you know, we were able to vote proxies on stocks that we we don't really hold in our model so um so that's kind of a, an overview um now another item that you can vote on uh through the proxy process are shareholder resolutions um so these are resolutions brought forth by either a group of shareholders or an individual shareholder that ask the company to to do something so it could be to report on something um you know report on your plans to reduce your uh carbon dioxide emissions you know um or uh you know plans to reduce non-recyclable plastic in your in your products something like that um so the, the kind of the general theme of those resolutions is that it asks the company to address a risk that the shareholder thinks is material to their long-term performance. Um, and so we we vote, you know, case by case on those shareholder resolutions. Um, and we actually can go a step further partnering with As You So, who uh, is, is a company that has experience actually drafting uh, and filing shareholder resolutions. Uh, we have uh, the ability to partner with them uh, for uh, to pair clients who are interested in supporting a resolution and meet certain ownership thresholds, which are set by the SEC to actually help file that resolution. So you need to be a shareholder to file a resolution. So um, we, allow uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll, so we basically, uh, a client uh, volunteers their ownership in the company to help as you so get that, um, that resolution through the SEC requirements, uh, which I might add have become more stringent over the last couple of years um, as uh, there's probably, uh, I won't speculate too much on lobbying, but um, the, certain, certain rules that the SEC have changed and the ownership thresholds have have increased. So it used to be owning a stock for one year, uh, at least two thousand dollars worth. Now it is twenty five thousand dollars worth of the stock held for a year, and there's a, a, a tiered system. If you've held it longer, then you need to have held less of the stock. So it, it goes back down to that two thousand dollar level if you've held it for more than three years. Um, but uh, so we we kind of can help leverage, uh, help our clients leverage their, their ownership to 
assist in the filing of these resolutions, which we know have an impact. For example, um, there were a couple of resolutions um, last in uh, 2021, one of them for Pepsi, one of them for Target. Um, and the resolutions never actually made it onto the ballot, but the company, when confronted with the resolution, decided to enter into a conversation with As You So, uh, which resulted in uh, meaningful commitments to reduce, in, in uh, uh, Target's case, it was a commitment to reduce uh, plastic packaging by 20% by 2025. Um, and for Pepsi, it was by 2030 um, to also reduce plastic packaging by 20%. Um, so that, that was a direct commitment that came out of a dialogue with As You So, prompted by the, the prospect of having that shareholder resolution on their proxy statement. So that, that's a, 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 something that happens fairly often where a company will choose to enter into dialogue um, and hopefully reach a resolution before it goes onto the proxy. Um, some companies take the opposite path and, and try to get the resolution thrown out uh, by the SEC. There's a number of ways they try and do that. Um, if there's a, a substantially similar uh, resolution that was filed in the last couple of years, they, they try and get it thrown out. Um, but the, uh, as you sow and Another group that we, we work with, um, ICCR, which is, uh, stands for the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, they have a lot of uh, experience in filing these resolutions. And so all the minutia of, you know, how many words exactly does the resolution have to be, you know, is a dash or a, or a period uh, count as a character? You know, there's all these really uh, complicated things that, that, that go into it. And so we really leverage their expertise um, in, in, in this process. Um, and uh, Daniel, I'm not to interrupt, but just to be clear, um, as you so is a nonprofit, uh, that is a nonprofit we partner with and ICCR obviously is also a nonprofit. They are in the business of this. And, um, so I'll give you a commercial for as you so later in our program here, but I just wanted to insert that there, uh, as an entity, they are a 501c3. So mm -hmm. sorry about that, Daniel, keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, each proxy season, we will reach out um, to clients who meet those ownership thresholds. So basically, as you said, we'll send us a, a list of the resolutions that they are proposing for this, this next proxy season. And we will check to see if we have anyone who has shares in those companies and if they meet those thresholds. Um, and then we will reach out to those clients to see if, if, if they're... Um, willing and um, if they're interested in, in supporting those resolutions. Um, so there are a couple of differences for this proxy season and actually for the, the last proxy season as well that um, I wanna to touch on. Um, so the first is a new requirement where the, the filing uh, owner has to provide two dates to the company to potentially meet with the company uh, to discuss the resolution. Um, so it's something that um, I believe out of around 90 resolutions that As You So filed last season, only six of the companies took them up on that offer. Um, and they, As You So meets with the client as well. So there's, there's kind of a, a, a guiding hand in that. Um, as you show, is the representative of the, the owner, which would be you if you were a client supporting a resolution. Um, and so, in the, you know, if it's just important to know that if you are the lead filer, <clears throat> then that is a potential uh, step that you would need to take. Now, uh, we would, of course, guide you through that process and provide support. Um, and um, you know, these resolutions have very clear messages, I think, that would be, uh, you know, pretty, pretty easy to grasp and to vocalize. Um, but we would definitely help with, with that should that happen, though it, it is rare. Um, and so kind of going back to the actual filing, 
Um, so I mentioned lead filing where you have these responsibilities. You can also sign up to co-file a resolution where you are basically the backup filer. If the lead filer ends up not meeting the ownership thresholds or isn't available for the meeting or something like that, um, then you could step in and, and make sure that that resolution has an owner who, who can enable it to, to go forward. Um, there's also a third uh, type of uh, support you can offer, which is signing on as a supporter of the resolution. There are no specific responsibilities that you have when you sign on as a supporter. Uh, however, it does lend some weight and some depth to the support of that resolution when a company is, is shown, okay, you know, we've got the, the lead filer following this, they have a co-filer and a number of supporters have signed on as well. Uh, so, you know, they, 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 it, it does help. Uh, so if you're looking for an option where, um, you know, so you don't want to meet with, with uh, have any uh, potential to having, of having to meet with the company, there's an option for you as well. Um, and so for this upcoming season, uh, probably within the next month or so, uh, we will be reaching out um, to those of you who meet the ownership thresholds. And by the way, this has also been somewhat complicated by our move to fidelity. Um, switching custodians uh, kind of resets the clock, um, but it was about a year ago. So um, where we will be within the the one year holding period. So it does cut down uh, somewhat on the number of folks who are who are going to be able to sign on for this next proxy season. But uh, that number will grow for s subsequent proxy seasons. Um, so. Um, so for this next proxy season, we will reach out through email um, with a, a description of the resolutions um, and then some next steps if you do want to support the resolution. Um, and uh, that email will likely come from me. Um, and if you have any questions on that, you can just email me back, um, let me know, uh, happy to, to chat about it and um, you know, address any concerns that, that you might have, so. Um, Daniel, is it fair to say we don't really know yet what companies they may be targeting? So we're not sure who might be, or do we have, did you get a little preview from them? So we do have a preview. Um, as you so sends out uh, a list with the companies that they are considering filing with. Um, and we let them know which, uh, which companies uh, we might have uh, owners for uh, just very basic information, and they're they're going to uh, to give us a final list uh, in within the, the next month or so. Mm -hmm. At that point, we'll start to reach out once we know that that resolution is uh, is being pursued. Um, and I'm going to come to I see a question, but I will come back to it. I have one thing I wanted you to speak to, Daniel. Maybe you were going to get there, but in terms of like, can this be effective? Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, is it, I don't know if it was 2020 or 2021, the Exxon uh, board mm -hmm. uh, situation. Could you speak to that? Because that was interesting. Sure, yeah. 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 So the Exxon board, so there's actually, um, that was a slightly different, slightly different process mm -hmm. in that the, so um, a hedge fund called Engine Number One, which really only held a, a relatively small amount of, of Exxon's stock. They um, they pursued a, uh, a, a a proxy battle, which is a is slightly different than than a proxy mm -hmm. vote. But we were able to uh, to participate in that um, still. So a proxy battle is where there are two proxies sent to the investors of that company. So. One of them comes from the, the board of directors that exists already and has their board, their uh, nominees for the board listed. The other came from engine number one and proposed uh, three new board members. I, it may have proposed more than three, but it proposed new, new board members. Um, and basically three of the, uh, of the board members from Exxon were replaced by the proposed board members from engine number one. Um, so 
we, of course, for all of our clients, we, we voted for those new, those new board members. Uh, BlackRock voted for the new board members. Vanguard voted for the new board members. So there was broad support among ExxonMobil share owners. And kind of the theme of this change was that ExxonMobil has continued to pursue a policy of extraction, investing in uh, more oil rigs, um, and not putting as much money into new technologies. Um, and the three board members that engine number one proposed were not, you know, just members of Greenpeace or something like that. They, they, were, they, they were people who had um, worked in the energy industry and had turned, um, kind of shifted the focus of those businesses to include things like biodiesel. Um, uh, at uh, Nest, um, it, the, uh, I believe it was the CEO, the former CEO of that company, which is the world's largest producer of biofuel, was one of those those board, those board members that, that was added. Um, and Exxon is now pursuing investments in alternate business lines than, than just extraction uh, and exploration. Um, and so this was an example where, you know, the share owners were concerned from a financial perspective as, as well as an environmental perspective. Um, they believed that from a financial perspective, it made more sense for the company to, to look elsewhere for, uh, for profits um, as, they, as, as we kind of see these regulations coming down the line that are likely going to, to move um, you know, uh, carbon tax to the, the top of the, uh, of the agenda, um, potentially other regulation for pollution uh, if the EPA can kind of get its legs back under it, you know, we, we would expect to see more re regulation coming uh, down that, that, that line. So it's, it's become more apparent that the future is not just oil and gas and that other, um, we, we really need to begin to funnel investment to alternate fuel types, um, of course. So, um, right. So and that, that was clear, a very- We don't own Exxon in our model. For those of you who no. have the model, you already know that. But naturally, we do have some clients who have legacy positions. And so when this kind of thing comes up, we search the book and see who's got them and if they're willing to participate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So th that was a very public kind of uh, coup that uh, really shook a lot of companies, um, you know, <laughs> and has led somewhat to a, a backlash against uh, these large asset managers, actually. So mm -hmm. right. um you may have seen Texas uh, is is trying to boycott uh, BlackRock and Vanguard uh, because of that of, of that vote. They, they say that they're boycotting fossil fuels, and so they're they're saying, okay, we're not going to invest our state pension funds in in these funds. Um, and of course, these state pension funds are a massive, massive. Uh, source of revenue for these big asset managers. Um, and so we may see in the future, uh, these asset managers saying, okay, we're not going to vote our, our proxies uh, for you. Uh, you can vote them yourselves. We're like, we're washing our hands of this because when we do vote for environmental uh, regulations or for, um, you know, in, in, in a way that supports environmentalism, we, we get, uh, criticized, and when we don't, we get criticized. So they're, they're kind of caught in the middle of this increasingly politicized uh, proxy war, <laughs> and uh, it seems that that they want to kind of wash their hands of it. Uh, and um, and so we may see in the coming years uh, this kind of pass through voting, where you, if even if you hold a, an S and P five hundred fund, you are responsible for voting the proxies. And so we'll likely see uh, third-party proxy advisors come out right. and say, look, right. 
you know, subscribe to, to us if you care about this, you know, subscribe to us if you care about Kind this. of like as you sell, right? You know, presumptively, you know, maybe an individual exactly. owner of an ETF exchange traded fund and s and could subscribe to an as you sell type of, mm -hmm. you know, proxy voting to not lose that. It'd be a pity to lose that. Yeah, that whole legislation is very interesting that could be a, that could be its own topic um yeah. at some point um but we'll we'll, we'll go right down there. if you're if you're curious about and want to learn more ping us and we'll tell you more but um yeah there's a lot going on because that same legislation has been used for other things um i'll leave it at that there's a whole movie about this a really interesting documentary called boycott uh, and they predict that in fact you know this is what's going to happen and it's happening so it's very, it's very interesting, but I digress. Go on, Daniel. Yep. So I don't have too much more to add uh, specifically on on the the proxy voting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is something that uh, has become available to us as we've moved more into the individual stock mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. universe, um, especially with the shareholder resolutions. You know, having those those ownership thresholds. Um, you really need to hold individual stocks to be able to be involved there. So uh, that, that's one thing that really motivates me. Um, and it's, it's really nice to see um, results from, from, those, from those actions. Um, mm -hmm. and, Even though, interestingly, as you pointed out, they're non-binding. I mean, but they are public and they are pressure. I mean, they are, they are a form of protest. <laughs> In a sense, mm -hmm. I think of it as financial activism, um, and I enjoy that we participate in it and um, and hope you as clients or prospective clients appreciate that that's really important. It's an important value to us um, at Chicory. There's a question in the chat I want to let you answer. Um, this is a speculative one, you can see. Um, it starts with, is there any hope? I can tell you right now, McNabb never has hope, but I do, so I'll just say that up <laughs> Oh, no. is there any hope I'm, I'm joking is there any hope that these proxy votes put even a modest break on excessive executive compensation do we have any evidence oh. where this has helped go ahead yeah, oh yeah absolutely absolutely um you know we do have significant forces arrayed against us but um Indeed. you know it, it it turns out that there are actually there is alignment often between wanting a company to perform well and um, wanting a company to have responsible uh, compensation and responsible policies and procedures. So, for example, when a company fails its compensation, like in, in this this study in 2018, about I think I believe it was over half of the companies that failed that vote instituted some change. The for the the most prevalent change that was instituted was tying executive compensation more directly to performance of that company. Um, so aligning the incentives of, of the, um, the executive team. The second most prevalent was simply reducing the salary of the CEO. Uh, so we know that, that this does work. I mean, it, it has resulted in, in shifts. Um, and the, the trend has been an increasing number of no votes on executive compensation as people are, are, are really kind of looking at it again and saying, oh, hold on, the CEO is being paid 280 times the median employee's salary. Like, is that really, is that really corrupt? Uh, you know, is that correct? Um, and um, so this is something that um, I think th there is hope for. Um, and when we look to companies run, um, certain companies in uh, Denmark, uh, where they're, it's just a kind of a, a different culture around executive compensation. I mean, there are, there are certain countries where, like the United States, where the compensation is just grossly out of proportion. But there are some, some countries where, where it's not. And I, I think that in countries where uh, the, the share owners have more of a, of a voice, um, that compensation tends to come down. And I, I think that um, mm -hmm. we've seen BlackRock kind of uh, move more into the activist sphere um, where they're not just 
supporting everything that the company is is is, is asking because when, when you do look at, at, at proxies the company also has a recommended so there's a recommended column that the, the the company has and of course they always say to vote no on these resolutions and yes to the compensation and yes to the board um, and so when people as people including these large asset managers are looking more closely at, at these at these proxy votes we may see uh, under the pressure of increased scrutiny, companies moving to um, to have more responsible uh, executive management uh, compensation. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that there is hope, but it's definitely an uphill battle. Yeah, and I think you've you've alluded to the fact that it's made more uphill by some recent changes. I mean, there is a there are a lot of what was the language you used forces arrayed against us. I think that's <laughs> nice nice framing um, where. Um, as there has become heightened awareness and people using their money in a way to express their values or using these votes to express their values or becoming more aware, becoming more conscious and being willing to move their money in a direction that expresses that consciousness, there is pushback. There's a lot of pushback because they're, um, uh, I mean, you know, you see situations being one of the, one of the int more interesting governance metrics that I, I think I think is interesting is when you look at how um, a company's board has have board members not just that are in conflict, Daniel, as you alluded to, but also who are on a multiplicity of boards. They mm -hmm. call it overboarding, mm -hmm. where they're really like professional board members. That it, it, the implication of which is that they're just put in place to kind of rubber stamp whatever the inside track is to sort of benefit the people who are most benefited and not necessarily benefit the shareholders. I mean, this isn't, this is not the way it was, you know, designed to work theoretically. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, like, again, I could wax philosophical here, but one does wonder if this is actually capitalism we're under or some other kind of system yet to be fully articulated and named. But the idea is we're trying to, engage in a kind of uh, kind of democratic process to express mm -hmm. um, express an opinion about how a company is run, how it makes its money, what are the things it looks looks at, how people are compensated. And, I mean, mm -hmm. to me, it just seems super important. But in an age where the majority of people do not invest in individual stocks, including people whose assets are professionally managed by firms like ours, where the vast majority of firms do not build their own models, do not invest in individual stocks, but instead employ outside managers, either in the form of exchange traded funds, mutual funds, or separately managed accounts. They kind of just outsource it. Then none of this happens. And I do feel like this is not to hammer home the point too strongly on our behalf, but I do think this is something that makes that our particular RIA, our registered investment advisory firm unique. We don't see this all the time. Um, in the um, in the world for individual investors, so you end up with enormous ma managers like BlackRock, who manage trillions of dollars through mutual funds or ETFs, having a tremendous influence. And in my mind, it would be a pity if they're cowed into giving up that influence. But on the other hand, um, uh, maybe it would bring a kind of a, a deeper awareness to shareholders. I, I don't know. It's an interesting thought. Yeah, but I, another I, question real quick, Daniel. I'm sorry, I'll let you uh, back in here. Do proxy voting histories, comp or special votes, influence how Chukri chooses to invest? Well, that's an interesting question. Mm, Daniel, so I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so there is something that, that we do look at when we, we look at a prospective company. And this is a very interesting um, topic, and that is whether or not the company is controlled. Um, so a company is is defined as controlled when over thirty percent of its voting shares are controlled by either a single person or a, a single group of people that uh, that exert control. An example would be Amazon uh, or Facebook, where you know. Uh, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg has pretty much absolute control. It doesn't matter what happens on the proxy. Um, and so we're seeing an increasing number of companies in the, the, uh, the S&P index and in the 
kind of all, all, all cap world index, which includes many more companies that are smaller, uh, there's an increasing percentage of them that are controlled, which is a disturbing uh, yeah. development. Now, uh, so there, there, there are three categories. So you, first you have controlled, and then you have um, kind of partially controlled, which are uh, between 10% and, and, and 30% uh, held by a, kind of a controlling group. Um, and, and then below that, you have what's called widely held. Now, the majority of the companies that we um, invest in for our clients are, are widely held. Um, there are a couple that are controlled. For example, Google is is controlled, um, but um, so so that is something that that we do look at at that level. Um, we we look at a number of things when we invest. Uh, the percentage of the board that uh, and uh, of management that, that that is comprised of women, um, and, and other uh, kind of other issues that also come up during those proxy. Uh, this proxy votes. Uh, so we, we do can consider that. Um, if there, you know, if there's like a, a failed, if, if, uh, if there's a, a vote, a proxy vote that we don't necessarily agree with, that's, that's not going to necessarily rule out that company for us. Um, in some cases, uh, if the company meets our other screens, um, you know, we, we see an opportunity to maybe assist with a shareholder resolution mm -hmm. there and to cast the votes uh, that mm -hmm. our clients can cast. So um, that's a good question though. And I, I think uh, the, you'll probably, we'll probably all heal, hear about the controlled versus non-controlled issue um, more as, as we go forward. And if, if you are listening and, and you are particularly interested in this type of stuff, I, I would recommend you listen to the pod. There's a podcast um, from MSCI. So that's MSCI. Uh, it stands for Morgan Stanley Capital something. I forget. It's, it's kind of yeah, an old. Yeah, I know. These acronyms. Now it's just yeah. MSCI. No one even cares about the acronym anymore. <laughs> but they put a podcast out, uh, an ESG podcast, where they discuss kind of the, how they uh, view these, these topics. And it, it's really quite quite interesting. And I highly recommend that. Right. It's part of the whole G of ESG, right? It's part of the whole G oh, rating right. of a company. And, uh, and as we've said many times, you know, there, um, in uh, global capitalism, if that's what we're calling it today, um, there are no perfect publicly traded companies. There are better and worse, however, and we try and find our way to better all the time. Um, but it is true that, um, uh, you know, there are, I wouldn't say dramatic compromises, but there are things we will give up uh, to uh, get something else. And this is also another reason to engage in proxy voting and other forms of shareholder resolution writing or actions because um, companies need to be prodded to do better in certain metrics. They just need to be prodded to do better and that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, We've got about nine minutes left and I want to um, spend a little time just uh, at a high level because it might it might shed some light on our decision making process when we add positions to our model. Uh, so Daniel, I want to just give you an opportunity to talk briefly about some of the positions we recently added, um, mm -hmm. the names, and again, just a few sound bites as to why the why of them. You know what? Why now? Why this particular company? It's just to give folks some insight into that. If you haven't noticed it already in your portfolio, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. So we um, we added some companies, uh, and there's a couple of high level themes uh, that um, kind of overarch these 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 companies. One of them being alignment with the sustainable development goals of the UN. Uh, the 17 goals, um, and um, and one of them also being resilience in periods of economic downturn. So we wanted to, especially in the face of potential recession in 2023 or 2024, um, look at companies that provide essential goods and services um, uh, and 
who might not see as dramatic of a downturn um, should we enter a recession and people have less money to spend um, generally. So uh, the first company uh, that we added uh, was Merck, which is a manufacturer of vaccines uh, and uh, other medicines. So one of their main products is Gardasil, which is the HPV vaccine, um, which uh, is a vaccine that has kind of um, become more, uh, more prevalent um, as people have become better educated about the risks of HPV. Um, HPV linked cancers cropping up um, in, in populations. Um, it, HPV was initially rolled out, uh, the, the vaccine was initially rolled out and the, the marketing campaign um, targeted young women almost exclusively, which was a really big mistake. Um, and also kind of painted that vaccine as something that was only for sexually active people. And so a lot of parents said, oh, you know, that's, that's not my child. So they, they didn't get it. When in reality, it, it is really uh, very, very good for, for men and women uh, up in, you know, up past your 20s and 30s um, and is kind of almost like a cancer vaccine for this particular type of, of cancer. So um, it's, we, we see sales kind of uh, in, in improving, uh, increasing, they've already been increasing um, more and more. So that, that's one of their, um, their products that, that we were uh, excited about. Um, the, the, the next company we added was Brookfield Renewable, um, which is a asset owner and developer of renewable energy assets. Um, they have operations in North, uh, North America, South America, uh, Asia and Europe, um, and those assets include hydroelectric um, dams, uh, solar and wind uh, assets, and they have about 21,000 megawatts uh, of capacity, and to kind of put that in perspective, one megawatt provides, um, depending on the home, uh, provides power for between 150 and, on, you know, 800, between 150 and 800 homes. So it's a significant amount of power. They have uh, 30,000 megawatts in development right now in their development pipeline. Um, and we, we saw, okay, this is a, a great company um, developing renewable assets and selling the power to various utilities. Um, we see that trend continuing, of course, for, for obvious reasons, um, and also being accelerated by what we've seen in Europe uh, this year, where following the invasion of Ukraine and the associated sanctions that were placed on Russia, Russia began to weaponize its, its, uh, its supply of natural gas to Europe. And um, that's gonna be an ongoing issue um, where I mean, we have this, this old infrastructure in Europe where people use natural gas for cooking and to heat their homes. Um, and they, they're going to need to change to electrify, um, and uh, so that's going to be. You, know, you can't do that overnight, or it may it may take a number of decades. But um, we do see trends of renewable energy, of course, um, kind of uh, uh, permeating the uh, the energy sector. So um, so that that's one we're very excited about. Um, we also added in Corning, which is a manufacturer of, uh, of high, um, high quality glass, high tech glass, which is used from, uh, it's used, you know, if you have a smartphone, uh, the, the screen is likely comes from Corning. Um, they also have uh, about 30% of the revenues come from uh, fiber optic cables, which uh, are used uh, to transmit large amounts of data. Uh, of course, we're transmitting more and more data every year. Um, and a lot of these communications firms and IT firms are updating their old copper infrastructure with fiber optic cables. So um, we're, we're, you know, that's kind of a, what we consider to be in finance, a cash cow, where there's just it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving for them. So. Um, they also hold 80% of a, uh, a semiconductor company, uh, I'm sorry, of a polysilicon manufacturer in the United States. 
uh, which polysilicon is used in the manufacture of semiconductors um, and uh, also in um, uh, solar panels. Um, and there's not really too much of that being produced in the United States. Uh, a lot of it is produced in China. And we see this kind of onshoring movement as we've had a lot of geopolitical tensions with China, where you know we're, we're it's going to be good to have domestic uh, production of these kind of essential um, goods. Um, following that same theme, uh, we we added in uh, steel dynamics, mm -hmm. which is a uh, steel recycling. Um, company. Uh, they use electric arc furnace technology, which is this, if you, if you go to YouTube and, and Google electric arc furnace, it's actually a very terrifying thing to watch. It's this, <laughs> it, it, they have these kind of giant um, uh, electric anode cathode type, type things, and it's very loud and, and very bright and very smoky. And, but they, they use electricity to melt scrap metal uh, and create high quality steel for the automobile industry, manufacturing, uh, construction industry, uh, transportation industry as well. Um, we believe there's gonna, you know, there's gonna be a need for, for steel for construction, infrastructure build out. Um, and this company is, is a renewable uh, the steel producer. They use renewable energy for that electricity that is used. Is, in the I, I love that. I find that just very interesting. I mean, I grew up in a steel fabric, a family that basically used steel to fabricate steel into things. And so the idea that it's a renewable steel company to me is just kind of really fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. Just to decide. I thought it was yeah, cool. it's, it's interesting. You know, there's there's varying levels. So with the steel kind of that that, that, that comes from iron ore, um, it re currently requires a lot of fossil fuels to to mm -hmm. to make a lot of it is coal, you know, and, and the, the the coke. That, that, that they use. And um, so they're still trying to figure out how to decarbonize that industry. Mm -hmm. But what we know is that there is a lot of ferrous and non-ferrous scrap out there right. that we can use now. And you can use electricity for that uh, to melt it down and, and, and create steel. So, And for uh, years that scrap has been going to China, import notably. Right. Yeah. And I do think that's part of this also this sort of insourcing thing. I think it's you know, mm -hmm. perhaps less and less going to China. It's really kind of amazing. Well, we're sort of at time. I know we've got more here, but I don't I want to respect people's time. Uh, but um, I guess um, um, just to, in conclusion, um, one of the things I want to make sure uh, anyone who's listening to this call or on call knows is if you if you're ever curious, if you look at your portfolio or you look at your uh, statement and you see a company and you think to yourself, I wonder why in the world they bought that company, why that company, um, there's a why behind every company in the portfolio. And um, Daniel's been hard at work writing up um, short, uh, relatively short theses, not, not whole term papers, but <laughs> a few pages. Um, for each uh, entity. So if you're ever curious, um, we're happy to talk about that. And, uh, and we're happy to give you that information. And we really have, uh, I think today you are getting how deep uh, down the um, detailed rabbit hole we have gone in terms of understanding um, why we own what we own, how we can help you be more active in influencing this company's um, we really have taken the position of knowing what your own really matters and that there are only so many companies that in the whole traded world that actually meet our criteria, which is one of the reasons why our portfolio is not an index. It's not a thousand companies. It's where I think we're at like what, 47 now? Where are we at, Daniel? Yeah, I think the, the, the focus list is maybe at 53. Um, so but actually in the portfolio on... though is maybe what, 40? Yeah. 47 something like that 47 currently mm -hmm. yeah so um so anyhow just all that to say um you know if you have questions um or if you are a prospective a client listening to this and you want to know more about the details of the portfolio as well as all the other financial life planning stuff we do for clients 
please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to have these conversations. And um, next time, next month, kind of piggybacking on this, we will have um, as our guest, I will have as my guest, Andy Bahar, who is uh, the uh, executive director of As You So. He, he was with us a little over a year ago to talk about their work. Um, he's, he's really interesting, has 30 plus years experience in this world of, um, what would we call it, uh, kind of activism, um, corporate activism. And so I would hope you would tune back in and join us. It will be a great conversation. Daniel, thank you very much. Um, it's sure. uh, been a pleasure to be on with you. Thanks for all the detailed information. Sorry, I had to cut you off, but we got to, we got to end. And, yeah. um, I just appreciate all of you who are on the call with us live today. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. So take care, have a good rest of your week and uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.